So the Ocho Crimenocum is about the beginning of the growing season. That's when we're planting our gardens. That's when we're finally getting back out to get fresh fish again or um, some of our medicines. A lot of our medicines need to be picked fresh and then dried if they're going to be dried because the oils are freshest when the juices from the lands are flowing through them. And so if you're picking in the winter, those plants are dead, they're sleeping. The medicine isn't there the way you want it to be. So you wait until spring and summer and, and to a lesser extent fall to, to collect our medicines because you need, you need those, those life forces from the land going through the medicines in order for them to actually work. So next slide. Um, I'm a Nishinaabe Kwe, which means I'm an Ojibwe woman. Anishinaabe is the people that we come from, and that includes Ojibwe, Chippewa, um, Cree. Like we're a huge, huge nation. Um, if you were to get in your car and drive from one side to the other, it would probably take you four or five days if you were driving eight hours a day. Um, I grew up in northern towns, but I was not raised in my home community. And that was because my father is a residential school survivor and my mother is a 60 scoops uh, survivor. And they were raised with such shame in who they were as native people and as Anishinaabe that they would not even allow me to speak our language. And they tried actively to discourage me from speaking or uh, learning our language because they said that if I learned, then I wouldn't fit in with, my, with the white people around me. And that was very important to them because of how they had been shamed for their language, their culture, I come from seven generations of shamans on both sides of my family, um, both through my mother and my father. And because of that too, there was a lot of shame. I have, so, and I was raised as a Mennonite for a long, many years, many years. And so because of the, that food, which I've always thought of as medicine, was one of the first things that I was allowed to reclaim from our culture. And that's actually one of the primary things that started me on this journey with our indigenous foods. Because when, when you live in a, in a community like where I'm from, it's a two hour flow plane ride north of any road. So when, when you get on that plane, you're in a little rickety plane. Most of those planes have been flying since the 40s and 50s. And they still have the wood interiors and they're very rough. But you get home and you immediately feel that connection to the land. And I think that is one thing for Indigenous people that has always been very important is that we we have this connection to our land and with, and to me, that is some of the most important pieces of our culture. So whether or not you have, whether or not you are able to live in your home territory or not, it's still important to have a connection to the land where you're at, that will heal you. That will heal us. All of those hurts from all of those things is where I come to for healing. When I, even when I was a child, I would go out into the bush and I would sit under a tree and I would feel grounded. And I could sit there for hours, just looking, listening to the squirrels, to the wind and that was my culture calling me back. I didn't know it at the time, but so wherever you are, any place you can find that's green and growing and alive, 
go there, you will find your strength there. Um, I, right now I live in a small town called Sulacote, Ontario, and it, it, I live in the very north of zone two. So that kind of limits what I can grow in my gardens. Um, you know, we can have greenhouses and we do, but it, it still makes a very short growing season. Our traditional foods from this area are primarily of fish and what can we can get from the land. And so, like we've talked a little bit about it. Um, this is, oh, wait, we're gonna go this way. Okay. okay. Ah. Am I turned around? Okay. I don't know how to do this. What's that over here? Okay, so this would be a blueberry syrup. And as you can see, it's a little, it's thin. That's because when you're canning with home canning stuff, you can't safely use thickeners. So what I do is I just do a little bit of sugar and mostly juice and I'll can it. And then depending on what I wanna use it for is how I'll thicken it. So that was um, blueberry. Here's some wild rose petal. Oh, look, there's a piece of grass in there. Can you see it? Yeah. Um, I have rhubarb as well. And this, this is pretty common in this area. As well as this will be a medicine. We'll be talking about this a little bit later. This is my rose honey. So it's just the community where I live is located a two hour north drive, like I said, but the cost of bringing anything in is $4.50. So we need to try and use what we have to because obviously bringing in a 20 pound bag of flour costs $80 plus the cost of that flour. So I quickly realized when I was, when I first moved up there that I was gonna have to try and alter the way I ate. So my, my diet became much more traditional in nature and we would have a lot of things like, um, all I pickle, or we call them jackets. I'm not, I'm not sure what other people call them. Um, white fish, trout, and what we would have to trade for trout because my community is located. Could you, could you sit a little bit closer to your computer? Your art, your audio is a little difficult to hear. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we'll do this. Thing. Okay, so uh, we have a number of different kinds of fish, but there's also a number of fish that we would trade for. And I think a lot of people don't even realize how wide our trading networks were throughout the centuries. Um, when, when we were young, we started finding archaeological digs where we had and I'm in one of the pink communities and it's called Wawagabon and it's we started finding beads from as far away as Mexico uh, things from the west coast things from the east coast and you realize that prior to contact we were all in contact with each other and this is something that has not been studied and has not been looked at enough. 
and I think sometimes that it can get very, we feel disconnected because we have all of these artificial borders and people have made us think that we were all at war with each other all the time, but like everyone else, we had allies, we had partners and we had spats. So just because the snapshot of contact indicated that these two people were fighting, doesn't mean they were always fighting. And I think that that gets lost in translation when it comes to our history books and stuff like that. And we need to remember that that's not how things were. And it's not how things are. We're all allies, we're all, you know, together. So this is the map of Anishinaabeaski Nation. If you go onto a map of Canada and realize just how large it is, it's absolutely insane. If you go, if you start at the east side of Ontario and drive eight hours a day, it'll take you four days to get across to the eastern tip there or down into Windsor. Either way, it's, it's a four day drive. And it's just, so, if you think of that, this Anishinaabeaski nation where I'm from, our region covers two thirds of that. And almost none of those are serviced by a road. I think there's like four or five of them that have roads to them. Yeah, I think that's, that's it. Um, yeah, so let's, let's see. What we, how we used to fish for our fish was with fish weirs. We didn't use obviously rods and hooks and nets because we didn't have access to those kinds of materials. So what they would do is they would make a large, um, it was basically like a holding pen. Like when, the, when you see cattle being um, herded into the different pens. So it would be a long thing like this going down the river and it would just be made of sticks. And then they would bring those sticks and they would just put them in X formations like this and drive those into the river and then take the fish up and then back around and then just herd them into that, into a small little area. And then that's how they would get their fish. So what we have here in this slide is fish pemmican and it's something that's fairly unique. So it's dried to the point that it flakes into tiny fibers. As you can see, this is about eh, 25, 28 white fish there. And so they would skin them and then just gut them and then stick a pointed stick through, through them at, with the skin on and then just smoke them. And this, it would smoke like this for about a day. And then the next slide shows what happens for the second day. So in the second day, you're bringing it a little lower to the, to the fire, a lower flame. And most often you're gonna be cooking it not only on that, but on a hot rock beside the fire. So people would, you would find these big flat rocks and if you could find one, it was highly prized because you could just put that on the coals and then put your fish on there. And then the juices would escape without you having to do quite as much work as when you have it on wood, like in this illustration. It's a nutrient dense food and it was used primarily for preserving the fish for the freeze up and break up when people couldn't hunt or fish or gather as well as during hunting seasons when the hunters were out. Um, if, if you're able to have it, it's typically served with blueberries and lard. And yes, I know it sounds a little strange to be just mixing up lard raw, but that's what people needed because they were so active. Like it was nothing for my grandfather or my father to walk 50 miles in a day through the bush, through the muskeg, when they were hunting or traveling to go visit their families. So, and lard was an extremely important fat in order to keep up your energy. So the next slide has um, what it ends up being. 
so oh wait oh sorry i didn't get that one to you oh let's see it anyway it ends up being about three cups of dried fish and maybe the people who are taking the class if if they're interested they can contact you guys and i'll leave you that that picture it's it's absolutely incredible because you end up with from that you know 30 fish to about four cups of fish and that's it so the next slide talks about um blueberries and there's my little girl. She loves blueberries. She's been picking blueberries since she was about a year. I think she was two years old in these pictures here. It's one of the favorite foods that we have in our area because wild blueberries are way sweeter and much more flavorful than what you ever would find from the store. Um, they're smaller. And what ends up happening is, is that there's, they grow in areas where forest fires have been. They, in fact, it takes about three years for them to grow after a forest fire. I know in the States they talk about wildfires and stuff like that, but here in, in my region, 98% um, of them are naturally caused by lightning and they're an important part of changing the forest over because in a boreal forest, if, they, if the evergreens get too big, then all of the food for all of the animals dies and there's no more berries, there's no more plants, there's no more medicines. But when, when, a, when lightning hits and burns off the land a lot of also a lot of our pine cones can only be released in fire so new trees can only grow after a forest fire our trees are shorter to begin with so what happens is um about three years afterwards is when after a fire is when you start going in and looking for the berries but they're the best i would say about five and six years after the fire. After that, that's when other vegetation starts to grow. But in our area, um, lumber and forestry is really important to them. And so what they do is actually, after an area like this is planted, they'll come, the government will come in and air spray, um, it's not Roundup, but it's made by the same company, but it's, it's weed killers over all of the berries, over all of the plants. And then they wonder why our moose population isn't where it's supposed to be. Because you can't tell a moose, well, you didn't listen to the sign. So we're constantly finding that we have to move farther and farther and farther into the land to find our berries because all of the patches close to the towns are being sprayed with these pesticides, I mean herbicides, every, every summer. And they're designed to make sure that the jack pine can grow and if you go into those jack pines i i call them jack pine deserts because if you look at them all you see is one tree and if you look down to the ground all you see is sand so i've i've been writing letters i've been trying to talk to people and make them understand how horrible the idea is why would you why would you kill the food and kill the food of people, kill the food of um, the animals who don't know, who can't read the signs? But these blueberries were, have always been one of our most important traditional foods. They were probably our only source of sweetness and sugars. Well, there's a few others, you know, like 
if you go into the bush. Um, if you pick cattails, do you guys have cattails in your regions? Okay, if you take the roots and eat them, they taste sweet, they're like sugar. We used to eat them as children. We would just go out and, and take them and just wash them off in the wash them off in the lake and then just start chewing down. They are sweet and very good. Kids love to have them up here. Um, blueberries are high in accident, antioxidants and vitamin C and they're very important for digestive health. They're just a wonderful, they're, they're a wonderful treat. So what we used to do with them was make them into leathers. So you would take them and you would just crush them on birch bark into about a half an inch thick. And then you would dry them in the sun, usually end of July, beginning of August during the berry season. And it would take about three or four days of good hot sun to make them into a fruit leather. And then they would just, you know, break off pieces or cut them. And, and then you can carry them in your pocket for a long time. So I do leathers, but I also make jams, syrups and preserves. And so that's but we do that with a lot of other berries as well. Like um, we call them head berries up here. I, I honestly don't know what they're called in English. Um, head berries is a translation into English from our language. I, they're an, uh, an orange little berry and they're really tough to pick because they're shaped like raspberries and there's only one per plant. <laughs> But Those if you are the salmon berries, oh, salmon berries. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've never heard another word for them. Like I said, they're just the translation from our mm -hmm. our area. But you know how hard they are to pick. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about canning because, well, that's primarily what I do. Um. What I have here is trout and rose petal syrup. And I do rose petal syrup as partially because it's, it's just yummy as part of lemonade, but also because it's an important medicine, which we will be talking about in a little bit. Uh, trout is something that's an incredibly important food. It's very oily, which is unusual for fish in our region. Most of our fish are very white fleshed, flaky, and I, I, I'm not going to say dry because it all depends on how you cook them, but they're not, they don't have the oils that, a lot, that trout do. So trout in our area, they only, lake trout only stick to like the really deep lakes. So they've got to be at least oh, 200 feet deep or 100 feet deep. Yeah in there. And so when we get them, the last thing you want is for them to be freezer burned. So low acid foods are canned in a pressure canner. And let's see, where's my pressure canner? Just. I don't know how many people of you guys have seen a pressure canner. This is a 26 quart and it will allow me to can 14 pints at a time, seven quarts and uh, I don't know how many jam jars. I don't usually cook that much jam. Pressure canners have changed over the years. A lot of them used to be um, We've all heard different stories of people talking about their pressure canners exploding. And this little button here is one of the reasons why they no longer will. Let's see. Okay, I'm going to go to the phone. Okay. 
So as you can see, my pressure canner is very aged. And so this is the primary vent release. And you would put this on and that helps regulate the pressure inside. Now, the reason why we use a pressure canner is because botulism is only destroyed when you get to a temperature of 240 degrees Fahrenheit. This is the safety relief that I was talking about. If for any reason this ever got plugged, this would release and you wouldn't have an explosion. This is the locking pin. Locking pin also keeps things from being able to be opened, especially when you have a small child in the house, which I do. This is what I use for a canner. It's an old ancient stock pot. I did actually purchase a real trivet for it, but when people don't have trivets, then what they can do to do water bath canning is just put a tea towel down on the bottom. So if you were to put a tea towel down like that in the boiling water, that protects your jars from getting overheated and you will not have a problem with anything. So tell people if they want to get into water bath canning, all they need is a pot which can cover their jars by two inches and a tea towel. So I bought this stock pot. I think it was one of my first purchases when I first became independent and out on my own. <laughs> so you stick to your high acid foods, which are water bathed, and your low acid foods you would use in the pressure canners. It's not, it's not something that's extremely expensive. I think I paid a hundred dollars. They might be a little hard to come by um, during the pandemic because I've been hearing rumors from my friends. But, but we have a lot of different um, types of things that can be done. Like, so here's the rhubarb syrup, like I said, wild rose petal, blueberry, um, the honey rose, but when it comes to low acid foods, like this is potatoes, that's all potato starch. I, I actually saved that for making bre bread. Um, another thing that I like to do are a lot of beans. These are kidney beans but you can do pretty much any kind of bean and you can mix them all up in your canner as long as they all have the same amount of processing time and same amount of weight that is required to can them. Let's see. Here is my vegan chili. I love that one. And I have trout stock because I believe that any animal that we've harvested, we should be taking as much as we can from it rather than wasting anything. So how I make trout stock is I would, after my husband has gutted the fish and filleted the fish, I take the bones and the head and the tail and I make stock from that. So, you know, like some celery, some carrot, some onion, uh, bay leaf or two, um, we have sage that grows wild in our area. I'll often throw that in there as well, just because I like to keep things as local as I can. And just I'll throw that in the slow cooker or my instant pot or on the stove. It doesn't really matter for about eight hours usually. And then you just strain it and put it in the pressure canner. And what I use this for is... A lot of our elders, I live in an area where we don't have hospitals. And so when, when women ha are having their babies, they have to come out for what's called the confinement, which is a bad word, which sounds really bad. But what it is, is they have to leave their communities and go and stay in the hospital for a month to a month and a half 
sometimes even longer, depending on if they have any complications. If our elders or anyone for that matter is needing medical attention, what they do is they have to come out and stay away from their communities. Sometimes my grandmother was in the hospital for four years because she they couldn't guarantee her safety in her own community. And that was very difficult for her because, you know, she had to share a room when before she had a house. So what we do with this, with this kind of thing is we will take it and make soup and put some fish and vegetables in there and just bring it into the elders so that they at least have a taste of home. We'll also do the same thing like when we'll, when we smoke a goose, for example, we'll take the carcass and make sure that we're taking everything we can from that, that goose so that everyone that we know can share in the bounty. We don't usually get a lot of goose up here, but some people do. So most of the, most often it's shared with us. And a lot of, a lot of what I do is involved with trying to ensure that people around me are able to eat our traditional foods and not have to eat them all at once. Because when you put things in the freezer after a while, they begin to degrade. So if you get a moose and you have 300 pounds of meat, what are you going to, if you only eat moose, all of a sudden it's all gone. Whereas if it's canned and sitting on your shelf, you can go, hey, I would like a little bit right now. And so it helps people that way. One of the things we make with this, this like this is our canned meat. It, it kind of looks a little interesting, but it's really tasty. That's its own juices. So what I will usually do with this is mix it up with porridge, because in this area they call it a lomanabo which is meat porridge essentially. And up here, porridge is kind of king in, in our communities. So what you would do, this is one cup of meat. So it's about a half a cup, a half a pound uncooked. And then you would just take your, your porridge, the meat, and then some extra water, salt and pepper, and simmer it until the porridge is done and then you eat it. And it was a way of ensuring that you were able to get enough calories because prior to contact, that was always a big concern for our people in our area. I was telling Brooke the other day that the first missionaries came into my community in 1955. And that's just because of the way the rivers work um, my family is originally from a place called Deer Lake, and it's not on any of the primary river systems. So in order to get to it, my great grandmother, when she did the journey, she said it was a six month journey by canoe in the 1930s. So obviously until planes were a real thing, they were very isolated and so we learned a lot of different things like um, if you want to smoke your moose meats, the best flavor you're going to get is the only hardwood we have in our area, which is called a diamond willow. And if you want to give it good flavor and color, you use red willow. And red willow, it's more like a bush, but it makes it looks really cool. I don't have any right now, but I plan to make some this fall because it's it's just fun. And it's one of the things that my great grandmother passed down to me. So I don't want it to be forgotten. A lot of things that we used to do when we were when in the past were based around food preservations. A lot of our teachings are based around food. Um, I don't know if any of if you have ever heard of the Wendigo. Now, the Wendigo is taught in a lot of different ways, 
but the elders have explained to me that at the end of the day, it's not really, it's a metaphor for hunger because the Wendigo was an evil spirit who killed people and ate them. So it's a matter of teaching people about food and that there is, well, never an okay time to do, to do that, but that was our traditions and how it was taught to us because in our, in my area, everything is taught through story. So uh, another way we used to do food preservation would be to dig a hole that would be about three feet wide in the circle into the side of a hill and then three feet deep into there. And then, so what you would do is you would take your vegetables from your garden and you would line that hole on the bottom with um, rotten leaves. And then you would take a layer of dry grass and then you would put your vegetables in on top of that dry grass, layering it over with dried grass again, and then more leaves, and then you would just bury it. And they would just leave these little caches of food about, you know, enough to fill a couple pots kind of thing. And they would leave them all over their territory for while and during the trapping season during the winter. And then when you needed food, you would just go and dig it up. And how it worked was the rotting leaves provided heat. The dried grass um, kept the mold from hitting the vegetables. And then the dirt on top provided extra, extra protection, both from animals and just the cold because our frost line in our areas goes usually around six feet to 10 feet deep in the, in the winter time. So as you can see, it would be really hard to do a traditional root cellar in any of our communities. Okay, um, can we go to the next slide? Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the medicinal values of rose petal syrup. It's in high, it's high in acid. So all you do need is what I was talking about earlier, the stock pot and something to keep the jars from being directly on the bottom of the pot. I use it to sweeten my lemonade, but it has a huge number of medicinal purposes with it. Um, oh, shoot. You know what? I forgot to get cedar. Luckily, I have one in my yard because I don't have Just a sec. Sorry. Okay, I know cedar is very common, but this is one of our most important medicines for this area. And that's because it's high in vitamin C. Um, normally you would make it into a tea, so you would just take a few of these boughs, put it into some boiling water and use it for coughs, colds, joint pain, lung infections. It actually has anti-inflammatory properties so it will help relieve your pain. Externally, it, you can actually just rub it on any area that's feeling pain, but most often what they do is chew on it and then rub it on. Because that your the enzymes from your saliva are actually going to release more of the medicine from that. And that goes for a lot of topical topical medicines in our areas, and I think in a lot of them. Um, with rose petals and hips, 
they are high in vitamin C, E, K, and D. They're, they do have anti-inflammatory properties. So they're useful for people with arthritis. It calms the digestive system. And actually there is some research that indicates something that we always knew and that it helps with blood sugar, helps to regulate it. So it's a really important um, medicine for people with diabetes. I use, I made this um, rosehip honey for one of my friends. And so how I suggested that he use it was to take a spoonful in the morning with his tea because it's actually a very potent medicine. And so while he was doing that, he was able to completely go off of metformin. And metformin is a drug that's meant to, that is meant to help with diabetes. But I've had a number of friends and family that have actually died from liver failure because of it. So it, it, whenever I can protect people that I know from it, so all we do for rosehip honey, let's see, I have a slide for that one, right? Nope, no, I don't. All, all I do is you take the rose hips and you put them just whole into your slow cooker, put a little bit of water just to cover, leave them overnight. Just let it cook down nice and low and slow, drain it. And you are gonna to wanna to drain it because the seeds inside of rose hips are completely indigestible. And I don't know any other way to translate it except for how it was translated to me. They have a little point and they're very rough. And um, because they're indigestible, that point is going to stay pointy on its way out of your body. And the elders refer to it as itchy bum. <laughs> So do not eat rose hips whole. <laughs> you either want to seed them or just cook them and strain them. But they're a very important medicine. They will relieve a number of different things. And rose, roses are found throughout the world. And so use the medicine the way you're able to. Okay. So I think that I, do we have any questions before I go on? I'm just showing the slide that talks about cedar being high in vitamin C. So that's up yep. for everyone as well. Okay. Yeah, so you, like I said, externally, you just rub it on. And cedar is it, like, I'm kind of in the north end of where cedar is found. I do know that they always told us that you use it fresh, you don't dry it. And I think that's because of the oils that we have in our, in the cedar. And that is part of the medicine itself. But like, I know that, um, we don't have cedar in Deer Lake or Wallagabuan, but it's such an important medicine. And we only were able to, we would have only been able to have obtained those through trade. So I, I think sometimes we forget that Turtle Island is so interconnected, you know, and even down into the South Americas, we all knew each other. We all, we, we weren't completely oblivious about other people in our areas and other cultures and other gifts and other things that we could learn from each other. And because why else would a medicine that doesn't even grow where I live be so important? You know, tobacco was was around in our areas. We certainly can't grow tobacco up here. You know, how how in the world did we get these without relying upon each other? And I think we really need to ensure that people know that that's how we feel about each other. Uh, 
I have I have a question. Okay. Um, and I might not have listened um, well enough. Um, after the you drained um, the the water from the rose hip. Yeah. Um, were you gonna? Did you? What? How did you? What did you then do to um, with the with the honey? Well, I just mixed the honey and the rose hip juice okay. together. The so juice. I, so you drank. The, okay, that's what I did. I didn't catch that. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's okay. That's fine. I don't. Um, you can do just the juice on its own, but it's a little. I, I was trying to make it palatable and yet not adding too much sweetness for somebody who is diabetic. And then put it in a, a, a way that's easy to use and functional. So it makes sense for um, it to be used in honey and then used in tea in the morning. So thank you. So you put, so you drained it and then mixed the juice in with the honey and then put it in a jar. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? I just want to thank Arlene for mentioning our connection with one another as, as you know, Indigenous, Native, First, and Amerindian peoples. Because I think that a lot of times um, in Native circles and non-Native circles, I think it's used to create more divisions than they're actually you know were because if you look at and you follow the plants and you follow the spirits of those plants you know there's so many like just corn for example or in my community the yayama which is the pineapple it was already in the islands when columbus came uh to our islands and what people don't know is that yayama is not indigenous to the islands it's actually indigenous to the what's now called brazil so it's just really I think beautiful when we are acknowledging how, you know, interconnected we are through plants and through food. So I just wanted to thank you for talking about that and highlighting that, talking about our traditional, kind of like our food highways, our food indigenous economy highways, if you want to put it. Oh. Oh, my, my little girl was out picking flowers. No. Nice. And some winter green. Oh, no, this is Labrador tea. This yeah. is another medicine. Yeah. This medicine was would have been used for... Um, and it, it, grows, it grows on the edge of every swamp and every thing of water. So it has... It's called Labrador tea. And what they use this for is, again, a lot of things in our area are high in vitamin C. And, but this is also an appetite suppressant. So when people were hunting and they couldn't find food, this, grow, this is such a common or, um, plant that people would just take it and chew on it and it'll help take away those hunger pangs so that you don't feel hungry anymore. Here's wintergreen, another medicine from our area. My husband was out oh, picking a little bit. Let's see, what have we got here? Oh, and the first blueies of the year, right? Okay, Desiree, got the first blueies of the year. Okay, here we go. As you can see, they're a lot smaller than regular store-bought blueberries, but they are so sweet. Oh yeah, they are much smaller. Yep. I know that anytime I've seen blueberries, they're on a bush. And for some reason, I'm- Bush? These are low bush. Yeah, bush. <laughs> No. Yeah, we have low bush blueberries. Yeah, I got to eat it. Mmm. Nummy. Mm -hmm. Get it. And a bush. <laughs> <laughs> Do 
This is my four-year-old. She likes to play outside. You go be with daddy now, okay? Hi. Okay, Lila. Well, I appreciated your comments about blueberries and fire. I thought that was really interesting because I come from a territory in California that is often on fire, more so lately with climate change. But we understand fire to be part of the gener regenerative cycle. You know, certain things have to burn so that the water can saturate the soil and put the nutrients into it to grow the new life. But I did not know that about blueberries and it made me wonder what about the blackberries in my territory because blackberries are so prevalent and they get like really big. Oh, okay. Like, we get like big ones. Even the wild ones are extremely big. And we also have the salmon berries. So I yeah, like our salmon berries are like this big. <laughs> yeah. And they're a little more um, like tart, but yeah. I still like they're them. Fun. <laughs> They're so fun to find, right? Because they're so bright. Definitely yes. when you're out gathering, it feels like you've accomplished something when you come across. And they're one of the first berries of the spring. Like we, I think that's what made rose petals fun for harvesting for me. And I, I should mention that there are responsible harvesting techniques when it comes to our berries and our flowers, especially. For rose petals, I take only two petals from each flower because I still want the bees to find that flower because I want to come back in the fall to find a rose hip. And how am I going to find a rose hip if I've taken all the scent from that flower? So, you know, it's usually two petals per flower. And it's the same thing. You should only take one third of the berries from every bush so that the seeds can regenerate, the animals can eat from it. And that's a lot about being responsible with, with the foods that the creator gives us. Also rose hips, when they're right off the plant, you can de-seed them right there pretty easily because they'll just open up. And so you are helping propagate the seeds when you're eating the rose hips. <laughs> oh my goodness. With us, we can't we can't really take the seeds out without a knife and a lot of pain, a lot of annoying pain and unless we wait until it's frozen. Do you have to wait until it's frozen for that? Uh, no, the fr the ones that are the first generation of rose hips that are coming, right? They bloomed early, so they're yep. still kind of squishy. Okay, we don't get those in, the, in our types of wild roses that we have. Yeah, these ones, if you split them, like they split really easy, you can leave okay. it as one thing that's split open like this then and just kind of run your finger up and yep. cut the seeds out. And then honestly, like a fresh rose hip like that is so fragrant and it just, it's so nice. You can just kind of chew on like this little thing, but it's a really big sensory like your breath smells good, you feel good, you're eating something from the wild. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and they're so good for you. Yeah, they have a lot of vitamin C, right? Yeah. Well, there. Are, I think it takes, what is it? 10 rose hips to, no, five rose hips to equal an orange. And the orange is what you need for vitamin C in a day. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I know one thing that I do when I'm having like, um, just like the, I think I might be getting the flu. This is not for COVID and it's not medical advice. I just know if I feel like I'm getting a little bit sick, I take dehydrated cherries and okay. rose tips and local honey, but I'll put like 10 or 15 rose hips in the tea and I make a tea that... Yes can take you back from the ledge of getting a cold. So, and it tastes yeah. amazing. Yes.
Okay, well, is there any other questions? I think we've just got one more slide for you. Okay. Oh, it's yes. Just your contact information. But I also just saw that Deb started her video. So I wanted to just see, Deb, if you were wanting to ask a question or comment. Oh, maybe not. Okay, I'm going to put your, um, your contact information up on the screen for everybody. Hi, uh, I've been listening. It, it's been really uh, a good good show. Uh, I I really love uh, the the whole discussion about the cedar and um, uh, the rose hips too. Um, I I love uh, using rose hips myself. There's I, I believe a lot in in uh, what what all it has to offer. Um, and love mixing it with all kinds of different teas. Yes. So, uh, yeah, this is, this was really informative. I appreciate it. But I, I don't have any questions. I just uh, have appreciation. Oh, thank you so much. Deb, um, is that your garden that you're showing us in your video? So Arlene, Deb is one of our instructors who's taught this uh, Honka corn growing method here. So. Oh, neat. Oh, okay. The three sisters. Is that the three sisters? It looks like it. Well, actually, I, I have the beans and, and the uh, corn. I, I put the squashes uh, elsewhere because I like to walk around in, in here. And when you have a lot of squash, it's kind of hard to do that. <laughs> I can see that. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm mainly sold on the doing just the. Um, all right. This is what I'm doing tonight. I'm hunting grasshoppers. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, I just uh, this this corn here is, is our, our uh, uh, corn that we were able to get back from our mother corn and so it's kind of special because uh, we haven't haven't even had this in over 150 years so we're pretty excited about it that our mother corn brought it back did you hear about that squash with the 800 year old seeds i yeah and actually we have a squash like that that we've been using uh, one squash will feed 80 people it's it's huge and uh some in our region that have been growing yeah it it well we have it looks it, it looks the same uh has a real bright orangey um meat inside uh it's really awesome uh we we definitely have to have a lot of room for that plant <laughs> neat Oh. All right. Well, there is a request for your contact information one more time, Arlene. So okay. I'm just going to put that up for everybody for just a second. Splash. There you go. And Arlene actually runs a Facebook group too, Boreal Foodie. Yeah. It's a uh, it's another like it's a sister group to first foods so one of the ways that we find instructors are um, also by looking for people who are are participating in preserving these ways um, organically right so there's not a lot of programs um, like ours that just highlight the aunties and the grandmas and the uncles who are are really just doing the work to to preserve these food ways so all right well i'm going to take this down and we'll open it up for any more questions okay yeah just i i'm just um i just wanted 
to say how interesting that was to hear about uh, chewing on cedar because when I was younger, if I got bug bites, my dad would take some tobacco out of his house and he would like, like if I had like a mosquito, I mean uh, a bee sting, he would put the tobacco in his mouth and he would like chew on it and then he would spit it out on my bee sting. And, um, but it worked really well. And I remember him t explaining to me how the saliva would break down the tobacco and then the tobacco would, with the saliva, would help uh, keep down the inflammation. So we we use it all the we use cedar all the time to make teas and stuff like that, and also in ceremonies. But I've never thought about just chewing on it, but it makes sense. So uh, an issue for that. Oh, thank you. I also found that interesting. Thanks to Kamsa for the reminder. I also was just thinking, I love the way that cedar tastes. <laughs> so <laughs> now I have yet another reason to, <laughs> to be tasting cedar. Yeah. I make a, a, a cedar and olive oil mixture because cedar is an antiseptic. So sometimes, you know, when I get little dry skin patches, I'll use that. Yeah. Cedar is just such a, it offers such a wealth of plant. Well, okay. Um, if there are no many, no more questions, um, I'm going to just go ahead and go through our disclaimers really quickly. We jumped a little bit ahead of them, which is totally cool. Um, but we do need to say them. So I'm going to do that just really fast. Um, we'll start here. So first foods protocols. Everybody on this uh, call, I believe, has heard these, but uh, we recognize and uphold and respect Native nations and their life ways above all else as the ruling governance of Turtle Island and Abayala. Everyone attending this space must uphold the same. The native knowledge. Lessons learned here are not for non-natives to monetize or repackage as their own. Native knowledge systems belong to the cultural communities they come from and to our guest teachers in our programming like Arlene. Intertribal space. We just remember that we're all from different nations and regions. So what may seem odd or undesirable as a food to you may be good for someone else. Respect that and don't insult or belittle. Respect tribal food, land, and medicine sovereignty. And remember that a majority of foods are shared by many different tribes, but with different names. So don't try and claim exclusivity for your own people. It's okay to share the name you know it as, but it's not okay to create descent over a different name. We also do not honor descent over blood quantum or otherwise more indian -er than you fighting. Foraging and harvesting. Please always seek permission from tribal communities to forage and harvest. These medicines or foods may be seasonal or they may be being left to replenish themselves, which is really important. You heard some of that from Arlene, um, making sure that they're respected, the plants are respected to replenish themselves. So also respect if the answer is no. Food sovereignty. First people have the rights to hunt, fish, and forage and harvest in their traditional territories. It's unacceptable to critique traditional or contemporary dietary styles as a non-native. And then finally, the ever fun one, First Foods is for educational purposes only before using or ingesting any herb or plant for medicinal or culinary purposes. Please consult a physician, a medical herbalist, or a suitable professional. So thank you for tuning in to our protocols aside. <laughs> Does anyone else have any, um, any questions for Arlene? Otherwise, I'm just going to keep asking questions because I always have questions. Um, 
I'm kind of curious for oh wait my video is off sorry sometimes I shut off by accident uh so I know we were having like um earlier discussions with regards to why indigenous people you know eat the way we do I know a lot of times in the larger industry called health there's kind of like a push for you know all peoples including indigenous peoples to eat predominantly plant-based diets and I think that you're in a region that really talks about you know how do you really connect with the land uh, when you don't have access to those things like you're talking about how it's like a short um, basically growth season mm -hmm. and why for your people or, or people in those areas why meat isn't necessarily harmful and why it's actually a good thing to have those uh I think it's important to remember that we are we are part of the environment. We're not removed from it. As soon as we started removing ourselves from the environment is when things started getting pinky. Like it's it's okay to be a vegan, but it's also okay to harvest responsibly from the land. Like my sis my daughter, she eats fish and she knows and Almost every single time she will say, thank you, fishy. Thank you, moose. You know, she thanks the animal each and every time we eat because she knows that there was a sacrifice for that animal. But as we learn more and more about our world around us, like they've, just lately I've been here seeing stories about research talking about the, that the trees have a language. And these are things that we've always been taught and always held in our hearts. The plants, they know that when they're being picked to be eaten. We're part of that environment and this, we have to remember that. If, if you just say, okay, and it's, it's fine to be urban. There's nothing wrong with being in an urban space, but sometimes people start to lose connection to the land. And if you when you lose connection to the land, it's easy to go, well, they're different from me, so they might be wrong. But if you go back to that land and just feel it and hold it and touch it, then you start to feel connected. And if we can all reconnect to the land around us, then maybe we can start connecting to each other in a, in a deeper way. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And I think it goes back to, you know, a lot of us when we were creating First Foods, we had this perspective that Native cultures across the Americas, our original instructions are directly linked to a relationship with the land that's millennia, you know, it's been for a millennia of, of a give and take relationship. But we know the territory. So a lot of times people think of first cultures or native cultures or Amerindian cultures as like, you know, feathers and I don't know, moccasins, teepees, all the other very Indian fetish romanticized uh, uh, small index, you know? Yeah. And what winds up happening, and I'm sure you could probably speak to this also, is that people don't understand that our cultures are directly tied into the land that we come from. And that's why when you practice an indigenous diet, you become, you know, sustainable, you become environmental, you become basically back in relationship. Yeah. And it's not harmful. It's just not. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's like something that's been really important for us at First Foods is that people start to understand that, you know, respecting Indigenous culture and, you know, looking at land acknowledgement as more than just a statement, but a practice and an ideology, and also how it relates to the cultures of our food systems and how we interacted with the, and how we still interact with those territories, because our cultures are literally because of the territories we're in the different spirits that are there the different um plants animals 
uh, the different temperatures or, or like how your people are mostly like, you know, very cold, frozen over lakes, <laughs> you know? So like, that's the reason why you, you eat the way you do and why we eat the way we do. And it winds up promoting a culture of seasonal and ecological food sourcing. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like every winter we're we get all stressed out if it's not minus 40 long enough because uh, that's how we transport all our freight like the heavy freight into our communities is we wait and then we build the roads over the lake but if you're going to get you know everyone's seen ice road truckers and actually some of those have been in our communities and people just laugh because they're acting so dramatic and everyone's like we just saw you. Everything was fine. <laughs> oh, but the friendly natives greeted them. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I've been in, a, I, my husband has, has actually seen a couple too. So it just makes us giggle a little bit because people think it's this big dramatic thing. No, we just want it to be cold so that we can get our skin in. <laughs> Um, I actually have another question for you for we have a predominantly native um, audience and a part of our target is definitely urban natives who might be living uh, far away from home or close depending on, on where their ter traditional territories are. But what would you say to young native community members uh, to get them back into following old traditions and ancestral traditions and really start rooting themselves back into the culture. Oh, there goes my baby. <laughs> I think we need to um, start talking to our elders and we need to remember that the generation um, of anyone from their 40s to their late 60s a lot of those people were in deep trauma. So we need to talk to those people who are 70 and older who grew up with more of the culture than what we have available, what we had available to us sometimes. Like I'm second generation out of the residential school and 60s scoop, but it was still happening when I when I was young. Like um, 2010 was when our local hospital was finally amalgamated so that it was no longer an Indian hospital and a white person's hospital. Until 2010, it was segregated. The last residential school closed in, in this territory uh, it, for Canada and it was in 1996. And I knew people who went to it. So we, we need to respect that there was that time period. So just because our parents don't know or don't totally understand, that doesn't mean that you stop there. You find an elder and it doesn't have to be your grandparent. It just needs to be an elder, someone who can start you and then you can just start um, going on your own as well from there. Yeah, thank you for that. I think that those are really important conversations that, you know, we really do need to start going back to the elders that we can, the ones, you know, that are knowledgeable and, and willing to share. And I think it's important, especially for, you know, non-natives to understand that being Indigenous is not a fetish. It's not romantic. It's actually very hard. Because, you know, we were talking about this earlier. My nation is about 528 years colonized. Uh, Desiree, I believe yours was 160 or 150. Yeah, the gold rush. So the gold rush and then yours is, was like literally round the corner. I mean, like, and so all of that um, on top of land grabs and resource extraction and land loss is us losing connectivity because of uh, settler colonialism 
And it's really hard because we are dealing with lots of historical traumas, lots of internal oppression and lateral violence. And so when it comes to things like reclaiming or rematriating, it it's deep. And I think that a lot of people, um, especially non-natives, aren't aware how much emotional, educational work it takes each of us to live and to really reroute and reground and resurge and try to decolonize as much as we can. It is very hard. Oftentimes we are the minority in our own territories. And that is a conversation that is not being had enough. Um, so I just want to thank you for bringing up these things. They're just so important. And I really appreciate them greatly. Thinking of that, my, um, my grandfather died during the tuberculosis epidemic. And we just found his grave in the last five years. So my dad has decided he wants to be buried there. And he's in the late stages of Parkinson's and people are trying to encourage him to go home to Deer Lake, but he said that he doesn't want to leave his father alone. So it's still very deep. Yeah, I know this is, I'm happy though that your father found his dad and you guys were able to locate him and he's going to go back to his dad, you know, and, and reconnect there. Yeah. Uh, these conversations are very deep because there is such a Today. Today. genocide is real for indigenous people. And I don't, I mean, I, I know oh. for a fact so many people don't um, understand what genocide is for indigenous people. And even something as simple as that, like finding your relative even after they passed and being able to go back into the land and, and lay there and, and go cross over there is, is really, it's, it's deep stuff. It's really deep. Sometimes I don't have the words to express it. I just feel like all these emotions, like right now, I'm just like, trying to like breathe a little bit because I understand what that feels like. And I just want to thank you for sharing that with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, uh, with that, I, I appreciate everyone coming to First Foods. Um, is there anything else that anyone wants to say or add or um, anything like that? Because otherwise we will wrap up and tell you about next week and do the regular housekeeping stuff. I think that's it. All right. Well, again, thank you so much, Arlene. We've had a couple of people say thank you, Arlene. Looks like Christina, Brenna, everyone's so gracious and grateful for you joining us and teaching us today. Um, as everyone knows, um, or maybe you don't, uh, please um, join us at the end of this month. So firstly, classes are weekly, but at the end of the month, we do a panel where our instructors come back. So you'll be seeing Arlene again for that panel with Unchi Kristania, who we all love very much and hope to see her um, rooster maybe on the class this time. I'm not sure if everyone caught that, but we had a rooster on <laughs> our last panel. It was great. Um, and also, you know, please invite your friends. We are going to be continuing to do First Foods with the wonderful and kind support of our partner, Ibex Puppetry. So we're gonna be doing it until the end of the year. And we have a lot of really cool things lined up, uh, but you know, it's a class and the more people who are here, the more dynamic it is. We love to hear from everyone. So please invite your friends. Brooke, you wanna send us off? 
Yeah, so thank you everybody again for coming to First Foods. Um, I, as always, we really appreciate everybody being here. Arlene, thank you so much for such a great class and teaching us all about rose hips and fish pemmican and uh, just sharing your, your narrative of survival with us as well and your, your wisdom. I, I really appreciated that. And thank you to Ibex Puppetry and to all the people uh, who make this happen every week. All right. Catch you next week, everyone. Tune into the live broadcast or the live premiere on Monday, 1130 Mountain Time, which is 130 Eastern, 1030 Pacific. And we'll see you then. Have a good day. Bye.